The monster's hands were wrapped around my neck. He sat on my chest. My 10-year-old body wasn't designed to withhold this type of trauma. He had hold of me like I was his prey. The physical scars bear witness of two years' cruelty. The signs were obvious. Personal spaces and private moments were violated and sometimes photographed. He was a slave to his urges. The monster was a man who found his way into my grandmother's farm by way of the church. My feminine attributes were the calling card to him. I was too young to know the sexual orientation of a transgender child should not be the reason for abuse, molestation, or violence. We're gonna have so much fun, buddy. He whispered. A heavy breath was evident of alcohol the first day he arrived on the farm. His stare was piercing. His hands were calloused. I was aware of his disheveled hair and unkept beard. I was hesitant to introduce myself. He was an abandoned man who fell on hard times. My grandmother, an avid Christian woman, believed all people were worth a helping hand. Her kindness welcomed him with open arms. Want to help me with chores? Said so convincingly. A helpful and religious farmhand who gained my grandmother's trust with religion, hard work, and stories of a broken home was nothing more but a destructive force. This was punishment. I did not grasp the concept of inappropriate touches or the fact that forbidden areas even existed. If you tell anyone, I can make you disappear. He assured me. He threatened me in those moments of confinement and solitude. I didn't, it didn't sound like the tone he used to talk to my grandmother. I never knew the farm had so many hiding places. All the places used for childhood games and hide and seek, like the barn, the chicken coop, were now places of terror. Within a moment's flash, the light from his eyes were absent. I would find myself scared and pleading him to stop. I realized from the time I was eight, I like kissing boys. <laughs> to be a boy and chasing girls was the expectation, but a foreign concept to me. Paul was 13. He was, one and, he was my one and only friend. We went to different schools and knew each other because we were neighbors. We hid in the laundry room. He wanted to show me something. He, he said he saw his older brother doing this to his girlfriend. Paul leaned in and told me to close my eyes. I would feel the drool all over my face and his hands in my shorts. My uncle burst in. Hell no, Paul, get out! I quickly, I quickly tried to remove Paul's hands, but my uncle was um, swift to do so. The cheese spread in the house like wildfire. Mannerisms that were the sign of Respect were like, like, please and thank you. We're now frowned on because my demeanor was seen as feminine. Because I love to sing, I love to dance, I love to cook. I was well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> He's gay! <sighs> I could hear the house in full swarm. The taunts and bullying rooted from my family. My uncles were the worst. The segregation had begun. You're nothing, screamed my mother. Those words were seared in my memory. The weight of the words could only be lessened by the humble mannerisms of Ramona, my grandmother. I ran to hide in the arms of my protector. All I could do was bury my head into my grandmother's shoulders I tried to drown out the screaming by closing my eyes and holding on tighter. I became a refugee in my own home. My grandmother was a runaway herself. Her soft, almond, deep-set brown eyes had the power to comfort. The wrinkles, gray hair, and arthritic hands were evidence of her hardships working at Tortilleria. 
Her hugs were an embrace of warmth. Fuera todos. My grandmother defended her favorite grandchild. She had no tolerance for hate or bigotry. Aquí mando yo. My grandmother said, reminding my family. The pots and plans flew across the room. She had had enough. Reminding my parents they lost all rights because of their messy divorce. The D word. Divorce. (laughs) How was I to know the expectations of of such a proud family? My grandmother's tears, I'm sorry, my tears were misrepresented as weakness, adding to that machismo stigma. Paranoia, fear, denial filled my insecure male family members, which brought up the insulting inquiries of everyday life. Was he checking me out? Is there anything we can do to not make you gay? Did we fail as a family? Are you going to cut it off? (laughs) My family was the least of my worries. The sexual identity of an eight-year-old of a child was taboo. Voicing my opinion deemed as disrespectful because I brought shame to this family. I had to live in silence for so, so long. Exiled to the arms of my loving grandmother, she was the only shield I had. Her farm was the only home I knew. My family frantically tried to explain my sexuality to each other. Paul was no longer welcome to come to my home. My family could not see the real horror that was happening to me at the farm. Mire que bonitas las plantas, ama. I exclaimed. The garden grew so perfectly. The soil was bliss, evergreen and entwined ivy, cascading close to the cinder cinder block walls that encased my garden. I know. Love it. We built a cool and tranquil pond together, which became my escape. My happy place was always welcoming. Long, arduous days in school filled with taunts had no end. I came home to my uncles and cousins, adding to the emotional distress. Along came the monster as well to prowl over me. My grandmother and my garden were always waiting. The stress and displacement of emotional outbursts only made me wish the garden was bigger. Sorry, you guys, I get choked up. Sorry. I could not avoid chores, nor could I avoid the monster. Every day after school, I would come home, go about my daily duties. I would find him lurking in the barn, watching me, grabbing himself. Seeing how my family reacted to Paul, how could I tell them? What would they do to me then? The monster said it was my fault because I was a pretty boy. He said, I let him on. I will say. He knew the power he had over me and would taunt me. My grandmother saved me from neglectful parents and became my savior when no one else could. How could I tell her about these gross encounters? I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I screamed at the top of my lungs every time we had an encounter. But that was only in my head. Two years had passed since the monster's arrival. The degree of physical and sexual abuse elevated to the point where my clothes and my demeanor could no longer hide my, the bruises and the choke marks. My grandmother's failing health and gradual loss of vision due to her cataracts could not see the damage. Her Christian faith and trusting heart were never able to conceive such acts. 
The forbidden sexual acts were soon coming into the light. I wanted more than anything to be loved and protected. I had to muster the courage to speak up. I was ashamed to tell my grandmother, the person I love most in this world. I was too embarrassed to tell my grandmother that the, disres that the respectful man from church was a monster and he had been torturing me. As my grandmother sat in the kitchen, at the kitchen table knitting, I walked towards her and she took a sip of coffee. I tugged on her dress. This was it. Moment of truth. Por favor, ama. I asked my feeble grandmother to take me to 911. I had to find protection. At the station, Michelle, an advocate, with certificates hanging on the wall, embellished with gold seals and fancy writing, would take note as fast as she could. The only words I could make out were, in God we trust. I had confessed to a stranger. Michelle was not God, but I had to trust her. Her face was pale. The bags under her eyes and broken capillaries around her nose were, a sign, were signs of long nights, but were welcoming to me. She would helped others and said she could help me too. As I spoke, I felt myself sinking further into the chair. Detective Daniel entered the room quietly, announced by Michelle. He was trained to dig for the gore and the filth. He swiftly started taking notes. Where did he hurt you? Inquired Michelle. The classic anatomical doll was presented to me. I hesitantly pointed to all the secret areas that had been touched and hurt. My grandmother was frozen with fear. She was unable to understand due to the language barrier. She insisted on being informed. I did my best to translate. Now at 10 years old, I learned the meaning of the word molestation. Dios mío, no, my grandmother guessed. The interviews continued with other staff members and the questions were repeated constantly. I was numb. They asked details about school, the people I played with, and strangers I talked to. I couldn't restrain from speaking. Shrouded by the scent of coffee, the gray walls and expensive suits, it felt like they were my friends. I had never seen so many people ask me about me, my bruised body parts, and how bad I hurt. Finally, they would see. I was swiftly taken by social services. Immediately sent away to a special school called Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall in Downey, California, because the farm was not safe. A concrete building with special beds, barred windows, and screaming kids made me feel scared. I was trembling uncontrollably I was put in seg, which I found out later it meant segregation because I was only 10 years old. I was left in solitude. And this area is where you'll be safe. You'll sleep over here. Said a tall, lean staff member named Joseph as he pointed to the bed by the window. The rooms themselves told the history of guests who had passed through here. Now and then I would find messages and drawings on the wall. The frames on the wall near the office were filled with pictures of happy children. The school had a staff of volunteers and men dressed like police. The halls were white mazes of identical corners and endless corridors. The smell of bleach and apple cinnamon filled the labyrinth. What I thought was an eternity 
was only two weeks. I was still in shock. The only thing I wanted to do was hug my grandmother. I had never been separated from her for more than a day. I was hungry for her homemade tortillas and refried beans. I missed my brother David and his goofy smile with the chip tooth. I remember waking up in the juvie room a few mornings and getting dressed to go feed the livestock, remembering I needed to collect the fresh eggs, remembering to feed the dogs. Half asleep and stumbling over my shoes, I would come to the reala realization that the corrals and stables were lucid dreams. One humid midsummer's day, a counselor dressed in white told me to clean my room and gather my things. He insisted I hurry up. What I thought was my punishment for speaking out had come to an end. I was able to come home. When I got to the farm, Waiting for me on the porch was my light. I hugged my grandmother. I embraced her aura of tobacco, coffee, and soil. She had maintained my garden in my absence. It was evident by the soil underneath her fingernails. Hours passed and yet the police didn't go away. The two officers stood post on the porch waiting for the monster's arrival. He was out picking up feed for the livestock and had not yet returned. My brother and I were asked to stay in the house. It was getting dark and the moon was shining bright. I remember telling my brother that I love seeing the full moon. I love the glow that reflected from the pond as we looked outside the window. <clears throat> I remember the evening air full of night blooming jasmine. Suddenly everything was disrupted. Spotlights and sirens filled, shattered the silence and the officer approached us. The deep resonating voice of the man rose above the commotion telling me it was time. My grandmother asked me to follow the detective. I grabbed a hold of his hand. Just as swiftly as we made contact, I was holding on to the stocky, itchy neck. He was warm and smelled of leather and old spice. ¿Cómo se llama usted otra vez? I asked. He responded with a simple smile. Is that the monster, son? As the detective pointed to the squad car. I was asked to identify the man. A bright light shined on his face. Terrified, I responded with a simple nod. I was afraid if I spoke up, he would hear me, remembering what he would do to me. I felt so helpless, yet empowered also. Confirming his identity, the once resentful family was now united. A member of the flock had been hurt and suddenly they became the wolves. I had never seen such unison. The detective passed me over to my aunt. He refrained my uncles from violently attacking the culprit. The monster was placed in metal bracelets and put in the back of a car and taken away. I took a deep breath. The burden had been lifted and I was free to live. I was free.